Today's topic, I want to discuss annuities for retirement income and really go in depth about why somebody would leverage an annuity for retirement income and then why it may be important to avoid an annuity if you're trying to accomplish some other sort of goal or maybe you have just a, uh, you're more risk tolerant, uh, less risk averse, um, you know, different aspects off of what the accounts are currently available and how to make sure that you're not falling victim to common mistakes and the common traps that some of these carriers, you know, try to provide with this, uh, you know, these little guarantees or these little roll-ups and just kind of getting into uh, more of, you know, what, what's the bottom line? Why would I use this? Why would I not? So first off, the whole purpose of annuities or when somebody's going to leverage an annuity for their portfolio is to make sure that their income is going to be greater than or equal to what their expenses are throughout retirement. So when somebody's working for a company, they're working for a company, they may be placing money aside into a savings account, checking account, their 401k account through work, uh, maybe an IRA that they set up on the side, maybe they you know, put their money in a business and then they sold the business or sold the house, and they ultimately have these little buckets that are just sitting there by the time that they hit retirement. So when this individual is no longer working and they're deeming their retirement years, well, then there's no longer that income coming to them from their occupation. So that's where they have to leverage different sorts of guaranteed income sources, such as Social Security income, such as pension income, different things that say, I don't have to go to work, but I'm still going to be receiving some sort of income. So this is where it makes sense to figure out what your gap is if you do have a gap. So like what I mean by that is let's say if somebody has $80,000 of expenses when they hit their retirement years and they only have income from Social Security and pension for $60,000, well then there's a gap of 20 grand there. If you have these little buckets that are sitting here, how can you make sure to leverage a portion or a few of these buckets to make sure that you're going to close this $20,000 gap. Now you could do this by leveraging investments and saying, okay, I'm hoping I'm going to get X amount of rate of return. And then I'm hoping that as I'm pulling monies from these accounts, the market's not going to go down. So therefore I'm pulling money from an account that could potentially go down. And I'm also paying fees for that. For the individual that doesn't want to have that headache, they could go and leverage an insurance company that offers an annuity to say out of these different buckets, Let's say if it totaled $600,000 as an example, well, or if there's certain accounts, certain ways on how you can leverage a safe strategy to take a portion of these monies, place it into an annuity, and trigger some sort of cash flow for that $20,000 gap, maybe it might only cost $200,000 or $300,000, something that doesn't have to leverage the full bucket. You don't have to use all six hundred grand in this example to try to just create a type of income strategy only use what's necessary, the smallest amount of dollars and only as much as necessary to close up this gap. So for an individual's first step, it's figuring out, okay, what are my expenses now? If I'm going to be nearing retirement, what are my retirement expenses going to be? And then the opposite side of the coin, what are my guaranteed income sources? Majority of individuals, unfortunately, or are not offered a pension plan. So this is where individuals have to rely solely on Social Security income and say, okay, well, at least my Social Security income is going to be X amount of dollars. And then I have a lot of money saved up for my 401k, for my IRA, my Roth IRA, maybe my Roth 401k, maybe some non-qualified accounts because I sold that property, whatever that case is. So it's all about trying to figure out, okay, what are some of my guaranteed income sources right now? What do I need to get to? And then what is ultimately my gap? Once you're able to figure out what the gap is, that's where it's it's now moving the pieces together to say, okay, this if I go and I leverage this strategy or if I leverage this sort of account or this sort of product, this is what it's going to close my gap. If I go and I could you know take the full money, go into some sort of growth related strategy, but nothing's guaranteed that this income is going to last me for the rest of my life. That's one aspect that individuals take the you know they try to leverage that sort of technique that could that could completely burn them. Or what they could do is, okay, let me optimize my areas correctly. Let me make sure that if I'm looking to trigger income or if I'm looking for an income strategy, let me leverage income-related tools, income-related vehicles. If I'm looking for a growth strategy, I don't want to be leveraging income-related tools. If I'm looking for a safe accumulation strategy, 
I don't want to be leveraging income related tools. If, if let's say you're looking for a liquid strategy, well, then you want to have things that are liquid, checking, savings accounts, maybe leaving a portion of your IRAs and your 401ks in those, you know, money market based accounts so that it's not getting susceptible to downward market losses. And it's something that you could pull from at any point in time. So there's always going to be some pros and cons, which was that with whatever angle you take, it's just all about making sure you're taking the correct approach. And then you're only placing those small dollars in there so that you're getting the most amount of leverage. Just like any sort of tool, you're leveraging the best possible outcome, the most efficient outcome while leaving the most amount of dollars possible, uh, you know, on, on, on the sidelines is really your, your discretionary dollars, your fund dollars. So if you're trying to use an annuity product to accomplish what that gap is, well, you have three main mechanisms on how to do this. You could leverage old fashioned strategies such as annuitization, and these are comprised of your DIAs, deferred income annuities, your SPIA, single premium immediate annuities, your QLACs, qualified longevity annuity contracts, where with annuitization, what that means is you're giving a lump sum to the insurance company. The insurance company is saying, okay, you're X amount of age. What we're going to do is leverage the law of large numbers, leverage our mortality tables, and then come back with some sort of offer that's going to say, okay, if somebody gives us $100,000 and let's say they're 65 years old, you might have company ABC that's going to give this person $7,000 every year to the day they pass away, as opposed to company XYZ might give this person $5,500 per year. It's the same $100,000. You could have the same car, you could have, uh, you know, two companies that have the same sorts of ratings, the same sorts of financials, but one could give a higher guarantee to somebody that's age 65 as opposed to the other one that's age 65. So that's where you want to compare what are the best offers. Now, me personally, I don't like annuitized contracts. I think that that makes an individual lose too much control. What I mean by that in this example, let's say if an individual goes with a single premium, you know, immediate annuity or they, they, they take a single life only option when they're giving their lump sum to the insurance company, meaning that the insurance company is going to keep these monies and then pay this individual an income stream that individual can never outlive. In this example, let's say if they went with the top option with company ABC and they give $100,000 to company ABC, company ABC says, okay, this person's 65 years old. We're going to give them $7,000 the first year, $7,000 the second year, $7,000 the third year. And all of a sudden, bam, this individual unfortunately passes away. They would have given $100,000 to the insurance company. The insurance company would have been able to invest all that money on the back end, would have been able to splice off this little $7,000 increments, but... 21000 was the only amount that was paid back to this individual and their families. Now the insurance company, when this person passes away, the insurance company walks away with $79,000. And also all of that time, all of that, 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 that basically that control of this individual's monies. Now there's different ways on how annuitization works where you could go and get like a period certain option and, and all of that. Um, some the different joint uh, related options. But at the end of the day, that individual is losing control. Now, when we fast forward to early 2000s, you had these things known as income riders that came out. And then really after 2010, you had these companies, these, these contracts known as fixed index annuities with income riders or the hybrid annuity, which has been very favorable towards giving an individual max cash flow, but then allowing them to also have control of their dollars at the same process. Now, with income riders, be mindful that the only reason why you would use annuitization or you would use income riders are for income related needs. If we take a step back and let's say somebody's getting pension income and social security income of 80 grand. And then when we're doing analysis for an individual, their expenses, all they need in retirement is $50,000 to hit their bare minimum expenses. There's no reason to create a further income strategy or place more dollars into an annuity product that's going to produce them some sort of extra cash flow if the need's not there. So once again, if you're already going to be accomplishing your retirement needs by some sort of guaranteed cash flow sources, such as Social Security, such as pension income, could even be some sort of inheritance that you know you're guaranteed to receive income for the next, you know, 30 years or so, that, you know, that's a different story. That, that's a different situation altogether. What I want to discuss is this is more for the individual that says, I have a bunch of different buckets sitting out there, one large bucket that's sitting out there. I understand that there's a gap there. I do not know how to complete that gap. I do not know what to do to place my dollars into something or find the right carrier to make sure that if I'm putting X amount of dollars in with this carrier, they're going to produce me 
X amount of dollars of cash flow. So the combination of my pension income, of my social security income, and then of this annuity income stream or annuity income streams, this will be able to close my gap, giving me that peace of mind that I never have to worry about outliving my retirement savings. I've already set this money aside. I know what it's doing. It's giving me some sort of insurance that I cannot outlive these dollars. So the difference between annuitization and income riders are annu income riders allow the individual to control their account balance and allow their account balance to increase based on what sort of account that they're in. So they could be in a fixed annuity with an income rider. They could be in a fixed index annuity with an income rider. They could be in a variable annuity with an income rider. I absolutely hate variable annuities with income riders. I have a couple of videos out there on the reasons why. Um, but just typically they, the, the variable annuities with income riders do not pay as high of a cash flow as the fixed index annuities with income riders. So that's really the main purpose. With annuitization, I think that an individual should not lose control of their monies, especially when they may need it the most throughout the retirement years. So this is why I don't like the annuitization. Um, but like with annuitization, where it does make sense is, let's say if you have an individual that's receiving that, you know, $7,000 every year, they're 65 years old, and then all of a sudden this person passes away by age 95, they would have given $100,000 to the insurance company. They would have started receiving $7,000 every year. They would have been receiving over $210,000. We go 7,000 multiplied by 30 years. It would have only cost them a hundred grand after they got paid back that first hundred thousand. Now they're taking from the insurance company's pockets and the insurance company is still on the hook to keep paying them that 7,000, 7,000, 7,000. That's the beauty of, you know, the, the annuitization provision. Now the downside to that and really why I like the income riders is the income riders give you that same sort of mechanism. You could go place your dollars in there, get $100,000, place it into an account, have an income rider that's paying you the same 7,000 or even higher than what the annuitization would do. But let's say if this individual receives 7,000 the first year, 7,000 the second year, 7,000 the third year, that person passes away. And let's just say there was no growth with that physical money with their account. Now the 79,000, rather than it go back to the insurance company, now this 79,000 could get get left, get left back over to the beneficiaries. So it allows this individual to have control. If let's say they keep living and living and living and this person lives to age 95 as an example, they would have paid $100,000 to the company. They would have had control of their monies knowing that there would be some sort of death benefit there. If let's say they keep living and living and their account balance gets drained down to $0, the insurance company is still on the hook to keep paying this person the 7,000 and they would have been paid 210,000 from the original 100,000 that they gave to the insurance company. So it's allowing them to kind of have their cake and eat it too, even though that sounds much more powerful and much more salesy than, than how it really works. There's always some sort of give and take with it. You know, the insurance company, there, there are some sort of restrictions. It's not like you're going to place your money with, with a company that's going to give you an income rider. And then, you know, within the next couple of years, you're just going to fully remove everything. There are ways on how you can remove your dollars, but you have to be uh, very calculated on how you do that. It also has to determine, be based on what the interest rate environment is, whether there's some better products that come out in the future and it makes sense to go and take those monies and, and try to replace it or change it, or whether they just stay put into your, your plan that you set up at inception. So there's a couple of different nuances there. Now, the, the calculation on how an income rider works is by a formula called income base multiplied by withdrawal rate percentage equals your lifetime income. And this is very important when I go over the pros and cons because this is what makes up the difference between a shitty company and a shitty offer versus a good company and a good offer. And this is where individuals fall victim to the traps time and time again. And I'll get into how all that works. But the third option is the protected growth income strategy. And this is something that was very popular in the 1990s where individuals were leveraging bank CDs and fixed accounts, fixed annuities to utilize this as a type of retirement income play. And what used to happen is you had double digit interest rates where an individual would be able to go to a bank, uh, get a, you know, a five year bank CD that let's say paying 10%, say, okay, I need $10,000. That's my gap of income. Let me just go put a hundred thousand dollars with a five year bank CD, collect $10,000 the first year, $10,000 the second year, $10,000 the third year, et cetera, et cetera. After five years, I could take back my principal and then reinvest and purchase a new five-year bank CD or a fixed annuity. Instead of a bank CD paying 10%, a fixed annuity is typically about, you know, two to 3% higher. So this is why individuals leverage fixed annuities over bank CDs, but they would leverage that same fixed related strategy. An individual can do that with fixed related accounts. You know, bank CDs could leverage that with fixed annuities 
And because the interest rate environment is now starting to change and it's starting to go up, an individual could leverage those chips, you know, ultimately receiving just living off of their interest while their principal is protected. Another strategy would be leveraging naked fixed index annuities, naked short-term fixed index annuities, five-year accounts, seven-year accounts, things that were not attractive just a couple of months ago, which are now attractive because the increasing interest rate environment, you know, from the Fed. So there's a trickle down effect. When interest rates increase, you have more favorable fixed and fixed index related accounts. An individual, just like how they were able to live off the interest with that old fashioned, you know, bank CD laddering mechanism or fixed annuity laddering mechanism, if you're leveraging a fixed index annuity that could potentially pay you a much higher rate of return than a fixed account, that's where it would make sense. So we're not talking about using an income rider. It's these sorts of accounts have no fees, no downward market losses and you have upward market growth potential with uncapped indexing strategies. So you could still get a favorable, reasonable rate of return on these dollars and something that you know that, okay, if the market's crashing, I'm not losing my principal. I'm not paying fees on this sort of account. There's not sort of some sort of negative like an individual would, would experience with an investment related account. They could leverage these portion of dollars for the individual that says, I want to have a better growth rate than what an income rider account or an annuitized you know, annuity does, I want to get some sort of, you know, safe accumulation growth in there and then just kind of live off the interest and make sure that that interest is what's going to close my gap. Or if let's say the interest is, is minimal that year, then I could dip into my principal a little bit to make sure that I'm always staying ahead of the game. I'm always, you know, uh, able to accomplish what my expenses are for that year. So this is where the protected growth strategies uh, could come into play. Um, and really there's, there's a decent opportunity, especially more recently, um, because of the interest rate environment really just going haywire, uh, you know, it, it sets things up to, to have a nice, uh, short term account as opposed to going to like a 10 year or 12 year naked fixed index annuity. You can now accomplish these goals with five year, six year, seven year, uh, naked fixed index annuities that, that have, you know, produced favorable rates of return. Whenever I'm discussing these things, if you find value in any of this or you want to have any questions, feel free to give our 1-800 number a call. It's 1-800-566-1002. Just make sure to reference this video and ask to speak to a specialist or ask to speak to myself, and we'll make sure to get you guys on the calendar. Um, so that's really the why and how. I hope that that makes sense. Once again, why somebody would want to do this is because they might have some sort of gap uh, you know, in retirement. So it's something that does not, there's no sort of guarantees in their retirement. They just kind of have these little buckets that are sitting there and there's not a true plan. There's just ultimately these little portfolios that are ebbing and flowing with how well the market's doing and an individual is more scared. Uh, maybe they're more risk averse and they say, shit, I don't, I do not want to deal with what's going on with this volatility in the market. I want to have some safety mechanisms in place. So at least it's going to accomplish my income related need and anything remaining. That could be used for fund monies, for emergency, for growth, you know, all those different aspects. One of the most important things to realize when you're trying to set your money up into something called an income rider is not all income riders are the same. And then also income riders are not your true value. That's not your true money. It's a calculation account. So how an income rider works is you would go to an insurance company and this is where variable annuities have a lot of smoke and mirrors behind it. You have fixed index annuities with income riders. Basically what's happening is you might hear something that, okay, we're going to give you a 7% guarantee on your money. We're going to give you a 7%, a 10% roll up or a 5% roll up on your money. What exactly does that mean? Well, this means if let's say an individual goes and puts a hundred thousand dollars with the company that's going to give a 5% roll up, we're just going to say this is all simple interest numbers just so it keeps everything, uh, you know, really simple and, uh, and it doesn't confuse you too much, but, Basically, after the first year, the 5% roll up, their benefit base or their calculation account would grow to 105,000. The seven year account would grow to 107,000. The, the 10% account would go to 110,000. So let's say if we fast forward five years, the individual put $100,000 in and all of a sudden now they're looking to trigger lifetime income in five years. So we know the 5% account would be 125,000 with this is the benefit base, it's the calculation account. The 7% account would be 135,000. And then the 10% account would be 150,000. So you're looking at this and you're saying, okay, there's company ABC, company XYZ, company, you know, BBB, whatever, whatever that, that case might be. These are the different offers. Individuals are going to gravitate towards this 10% because they're saying, oh, that's the shiny object. My benefit base is going to be 150,000. Why would I go with this company? That's only going to be 125,000. 
and it's not so fast. The formula works with income base or benefit base multiplied by withdrawal rate percentage equals that individual's lifetime income. So if let's say somebody who's 60 years old, they put $100,000 with this company versus 60 years old, they put $100,000 with this company. By the time this individual is age 65, this company has a $125,000 income base, benefit base, but maybe for a male age 65, this company gives a 5.5% withdrawal rate percentage versus this company over here, we understand has a $150,000 benefit base or income base, but maybe their withdrawal rate percentage for a male age 65 is only 3%. So when we do the math, and you could do this with a hand calculator, this individual would have put in 100 grand, waited five years, and with this company, even though it showed the 5% roll-up, which looked like a much smaller number, the combination of 125,000 multiplied by 0 0.055 equals $6,875, or 6.875% cash flow that this individual is getting as per their waiting five years. Versus this company, it has $150,000 of their benefit base or their income base, and with this specific company, they have a much lower withdrawal rate percentage for a male age 65. You take 150,000 multiplied by 3% equals $4,500. So once again, this benefit base looked extremely attractive. Hey, this is 10%. Why the heck would I go with the 5% offer if I could go with this 10% offer? It was smoke and mirrors. It was a bullshit um, account. It was, it was a, a bullshit marketing message that they tried to do a hook, line, and sinker to say, okay, let's go and pigeonhole everybody in this because we're going to make it sound fantastic with this 10% roll-up guarantee, even though when push came to shove, if you gave $100,000 with this company, you were able to collect 6875000 dollars of lifetime income versus this company with the 10%, you'd only be able to collect $4,500 of lifetime income in five years. So this will generate a 6.875% cash flow this would generate a 4.500% cash flow. This option, even though it was a smaller number, it equated to a larger result. And that's all about using the contracts or using the companies against each other to find out, okay, which one's going to be the best for my situation? If I'm 60 years old, I want to retire at age 65, what's the smallest dollars and only as much as necessary that I could put with the best possible contract to make sure that's going to accomplish my needs? So maybe with this company, it's only going to require... $200,000 to place with this carrier as opposed to placing in $275,000 with this carrier, all because it had the shiny object of that 10% roll-up versus the 5% roll-up. It costs you $75,000 more to go with this option as opposed to going with the superior option. And that's what we try to help individuals do. We try to help an individual uh, create what their expense, what their budgeting scenario is, where they are right now, where they're projected to be in retirement, make sure that we're, we're uh, projecting cost of living adjustments in there, then doing an analysis off of what are their current cash flows, is there a gap there, and then, okay, based on their existing assets, how do we make sure to close that gap using the smallest amount of dollars only as much as necessary so that you have as much leftover money in your pocket at the end of the day, at the end of the year, all throughout retirement, to have fun throughout retirement and not have to worry. So the pros with income riders is you can have some really good income riders. You can have good roll-up rates and good withdrawal rate percentages for one company and then really bad for the other. Also, for let's say somebody that's age 62 that wants to wait three years, that could be an entirely top three different uh, options available than if somebody's age 65 wanting to wait three years until age 68 to trigger lifetime income. So it's all about the individual situation, all about also their state that they live in. Some, ca some carriers may be offered in one state and not offered in others. So that's where it's, you have to be very careful with how you set these things up and make sure you're not falling victim to an inferior product. There's no reason. Like, if you fall victim to an inferior product, what that means is you could be wasting thousands and thousands of dollars in the wrong direction as opposed to going to something that's superior that would be able to save you more dollars and, and keep that in your pocket as opposed to giving it with the insurance company. The other aspect, the caps, participations, and spreads, this is more for those naked fixed index annuities. Um, if, and simply put, if let's say you have one company that's giving you a 5% cap, Versus you have another company that's giving you a 12% cap and they have the same index, why would you go with the 5% cap? It makes absolutely no sense. Both of these grow when the market goes up, doesn't lose when it goes down, but this one is a more shitty product. Excuse my language, but you know a lot of these things infuriate me when an individual is looking at an inferior product 
and says, oh, well, you know, it's going to still give me growth when the market goes up and not lose when it goes down. It's like, yeah, but why would you want to do that if you could get set up in a much better position? So that's where a cap rate, a participation rate, uh, this would mean you're participating with the index. So let's say if you have one company that's giving you 100% participation versus another company that's giving you 120% participation and it has the same index, that means if this index gains 10%, you're going to get a 10% credit with this one company versus the second company would give you a 12% credit or 12% gain into your account. The next year, let's say the index crashes, you have a 0% floor. On this one, you have a 0% floor on this one. So participation rates just allows you to participate on the upside, but still have that 0% floor, that safety mechanism, in case that index was to go down. Uh, spreads kind of act like a fee, but it's a fee only whenever your index goes up. So let's say if you have an account that has a 1% spread and the index gains 10%, well, you're only going to get credit of 9 But if the index loses 10%, you're going to get a credit of 0 So that's ultimately how the spread works. Um, so once again, it's just all about kind of, you know, playing the game and, and, and looking underneath the hood. Now, be mindful, there's over 1,100 different options in a typical situation for an individual that's above the age of 55, below the age of 74, in and in, in specific states. So that's why it's very important to go to a specialist and make sure that you're not falling victim to these mistakes. This is what makes us different than other advisory groups throughout the country, is we have a proprietary system that allows us to go and filter through these different companies, these different accounts, and then more importantly, whether or not you need to actually use this sort of account. Because there's many times an individual calls us up, oh, I really love this video online, you know, I really want the strategy, I want the strategy, and then, you know, we're asking them questions, and you already won the game. There's no reason to get more income if you don't need it. Go and leverage those dollars towards a growth-related strategy or an emergency-related strategy or, or death-benefit-related strategy. You know, you don't have to use, if you don't need an income play or an income strategy, don't use an income-related product. And, you know, that's where individuals, uh, they're constantly confused off of, you know, what might be correct for their situation. Um, really, the next aspect is the importance of risk tolerance. If let's say an individual loves the market, they're gung-ho about the market, they understand the growth potential of the market, and they don't really care about, you know, creating a proper income strategy with some sort of protections, well, then maybe they shouldn't be going into something that's safe. If somebody should be more aggressive, stay more aggressive. If somebody's, you know, uh, you know, more risk averse and they want to be safe, there's no reason to be leveraging that aggressive play because it could bite them in the butt and that's going to bring on a lot of other emotional stress. Um, and this is where creating a strategy is, is, is key. You basically, you want to create, it's like individual pieces of a puzzle. You want to optimize each little piece. You want to create a strategy, not just have a portfolio. When you have different accounts and they're all doing the same thing. So let's say if you go and you have all your accounts are set up in the market because that's exactly what you put your money in when you were working and you just think, okay, that's the status quo. I just have to keep my money invested in the market. Well, that could that could really bite you in the butt if the market crashes. And this is where it's, it, it might make sense to leave a portion of dollars in the market or put a portion of dollars into your checking savings position, something that's not invested, something that's not put with an insurance company, and then there might make more sense to go in and make sure that everything's spliced out correctly. So once again, create a strategy. Don't just create, don't just have a portfolio and and, you know, just kind of guess and hope that everything's going to be okay. You know, make sure that everything is going to line up correctly. And then they're going to work in tandem with one another to, to give you the best chance for success. So if an individual is trying to leverage an annuity for retirement income, really the most important steps is understanding what your current monthly expenses are. What are your monthly expenses projected to be throughout retirement based on what sort of inflationary rate you're using or what sort of expenses might be inflationary based, what sort of expenses might stay fixed, what sort of expenses may drop off like a mortgage or let's say, you know, somebody's in their 60s, but then the mortgage, their, their mortgage is going to get paid off within the next five years. Well, then, you know, how do you account for that properly? Uh, and then look at what the cash flow is. You know, what are some of the, the guaranteed cash flows that you already have set up? And then, you know, does that close the gap? Is that greater than what your expenses are, that are, you know, greater than or equal to what your expenses are? And does that cash flow also have some sort of step ups for that inflationary need? Uh, because if it doesn't, then you might want to look at an income related strategy. And then, you know, really to, to my other point, optimize your pieces. If you need an income strategy, use the best income related accounts. If you need an emergency strategy, use the best emergency related accounts. If you, you know, if you, your desires for a growth related strategy, use the best growth related accounts. So there's different ways to make sure that everything will encompass an, an overall plan, not just be set up in a portfolio that's just maximized 
And this is, once again, a common mistake. Oh, I have this $500,000 that's sitting in this 401k. I just rolled it over all into an annuity and I'm going to trigger income. And that income is going to give me, you know, $40,000 every year. Well, you already have a pension. You already have a social security income. You know, those are already enough to accomplish your, your expense need. Why did you place all your money in an annuity? Oh, because the advisor told me I was going to get a 7% guarantee on this. And you realize that's not the case. That 7% is just nothing more than a phantom account. It's, it's, it's a roll-up rate to just try to produce this person more income. They don't need the income, and therefore don't create a strategy for more income. And vice versa. Really, it works all over, you know, through all spectrums off of all the different accounts that you can use. Uh, think of, you know, financial planning or, or these different accounts as individual tools in a tool belt. You know, if you're trying to hammer in a nail, uh, can you use the back of a screwdriver? Yes. But would be more efficient, more effective would be using a hammer to do that. Um, same sort of thing. You, you know, if you want to use a safe accumulation strategy, use a safe accumulation product. If you want to use an aggressive accumulation strategy, use an aggressive related account, aggressive related product and make sure that's diversified properly. You know, that's how, you know, that's how an individual could really, uh, increase their chances of success is by not falling victim to, to the smoke and mirrors and really a lot of the, uh, the, the information out there or not becoming educated enough to, to understand what some of those uh, mistakes are. And be mindful that when, in, when you are in retirement, if you're no longer looking to go back to work, you know, who wants to retire in their sixties and all of a sudden by age, by the time they're in their seventies, they burnt through all of their money and now they're forced to go back to work. That's a nightmare situation. You want to obviously try to avoid that or what majority of individual, uh, of individuals want to avoid that situation. Um, and then, you know, once again, if you found value in this video, feel free to give her 1-800 number a call. It's 1-800-566-1002. References video, ask to speak to a specialist. We'll get you on the calendar and, um, you know, try to help you out best, best we can. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I, I really hope that this helped. Uh, feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Retire Sharp, so you could have access to the most updated videos. Thank you so much, guys.